Thank you so much. So it's really a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, and it's the kind of pleasure that we call Nachas in Yiddish, because she is one of our own. Um, Ava Mrochek is an alumna. Um, she graduated in the year 2012, I'm allowed to say. She's a scholar of Jewish literary cultures and book history. Her first book, The Literary Imagination in, in Jewish Antiquity, conceptualized how early Jews imagined their own scriptures before the formation of the biblical canon. She has a forthcoming book called Out of the Cave, The Possibility of a New Biblical Past, which is about ancient and modern manuscript, manuscript discovery stories as a literary and religious genre. She's currently the associate professor of religion, I believe at the University of California, Davis, but Davis's loss is Canada's gain. She will begin an appointment as the Simon and Riva Spatz Chair in Jewish Studies at Dalhousie University in 2024. So congratulations on that. Join me in welcoming Ava. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think uh, most of my work is kind of an infomercial for the Center for Jewish Studies and the Book History Program. It's a kind of beautiful match. Um, so I'm really honored to be back here at uh, CJS over a decade after I finished my PhD and I wrote a dissertation about concepts of sacred texts in the Dead Sea Scrolls with a focus on Psalms. Um, so for those uh, unfamiliar with this uh, obscure but exciting find, uh, the scrolls are about 1,000 Jewish manuscripts uh, hidden in a series of caves near a Jewish settlement that was destroyed by the Romans in about 70 CE and discovered by some Bedouin goat herders in the 40s and 50s. Uh, and they've given scholars generations of work and helped rewrite the history of early Judaism and the biblical canon. And when I was working on my dissertation and kind of thinking about where I could see myself in 10 years, uh, I imagined, you know, maybe I'd return here to speak about some lofty and dignified topics that would make my teachers proud, um, like concepts of revelation or the cultural history of biblical interpretation or something like that. Uh, instead, I've been invited today here to speak about poop. Um, <laughs> So rather than justifying myself for this and trying to convince you that this really is the same topic, I'm going to get right into the texts. So as new caves with new scrolls were still being opened near the Dead Sea in the early 50s, another location in the Judean desert yielded a cache of letters and documents associated with Bar Kokhba, right, the messianic figure who led the last Jewish revolt against Rome in the second century. Now, in a 1965 book about the manuscript finds in the Judean desert, scholar John Allegro tells us that among these documents from this new cave, a few are fairly well preserved, but most had suffered from the depredations of visiting animals, human and otherwise, and particularly in the activities of rats, who, with a regrettable lack of appreciation of true values, had used the precious leather and papyrus manuscripts as linings for their necks. The excavation developed into a hunt for rats' nests, since each one was almost sure to produce remnants of a written document or two. Another contributory factor in the denudation of written material was that the later habitation by birds and small animals of the caves over hundreds of years had resulted in an abundant supply of guano, which the Bedouin had for years been collecting and selling in Bethlehem. It is not at all improbable, as Father DeVoe points out, that the Jewish orange groves near Bethlehem were fertilized with the priceless ancient manuscripts written by their forefathers. I mean, <laughs> right? Okay. Priceless ancient manuscripts, some of them scripture, are not passed down from generation to generation, but passed through the digestive systems of rodents. Textual scholarship is a dirty job, so we don't have the tweed-clad gentleman working in the library, but a scholar mucking about in rat droppings to rescue precious fragments of the past. Now, we're going to talk about the anxiety of loss and work of recovery of the past quite a lot today, but in this bit of mythology, nothing just disappears. Right? Manuscripts are part of the food chain, right? the circle of life, 
They're written by the ancient, they're eaten and excreted by bats and birds and spread as fertilizer to nourish Jew Jewish orange groves. And Allegro, quoting Ro Roland DeVoe, biblical scholar and archeologist, specifies of course that the orange groves are Jewish, even though Allegro is a secular scholar, DeVoe is a Catholic priest. Uh, so in this myth-making, right, this biological life cycle of lost manuscripts links ancient and modern Jewish life in Israel and Jewish texts are part of the very soil, right? The entire land becomes a Geniza. So what do we make of this really weird and honestly kind of corny piece of mythology, right? This is not the ancient kind of mythology that we analyze and study as primary sources, right? It's a myth that scholars spin about themselves in their work. It's a striking example, I think, of how this kind of scholarly myth-making is really bound up with a the theological imagination. And I wanna to focus today on one salient aspect of how we tell stories about ancient texts across religious legends, literature, and historiography, because this is supposed to be history. While doing other kinds of work on how ancient and modern people talk about their own scriptures, I really kept seeing a surprising fixation with filth and trash and rot in a variety of scholarship, in religious legend and in fiction, scraps of Kabbalistic secrets plucked from the trash, a long lost chronicle written in pus on a leper's skin, as soon as ancient texts emerge from the obscurity of the past, they're immediately threatened with degeneration and defilement. Really in the grossest ways, they're soiled with grease, with people's feet, with refuse, and with excrement. So we value texts culturally as carriers of verbal meaning, right, as vehicles for divine words. And here we see them dragged down into the absolute lowest forms of matter. Now, um, on the one hand, dirt and rot are just facts of biology, right? So written on organic material like animal skins and papyrus, of course, ancient texts decay. Of course, they become rodent food. That's just what happens, right? They're forgotten for hundreds of years. They're handled by untrained discoverers and dealers or even careless cigarette smoking scholars, as we'll see. Of course, they get damaged and they get soiled, right? But these real affordances of textual transmission, they don't explain the resonance of the motif and the kind of story spinning about it that we see. Talking about filthy texts, about sacred texts and rot and grease and shit, it never loses its kind of cringy appeal. So what does this phenomenon tell us about a broader cultural logic of scripture and of access to ancient knowledge? the true-ish and not-so-true stories that people have told about filthy scriptures, I think they illustrate a really deep paradox in the very idea of sacred writing that I think hasn't really been identified in religious discourse very often. So here in the words of 2nd Isaiah, and this is uh, uh, Isaiah, uh, the Isaiah scroll from, the, from uh, Qumran, from the Dead Sea Scrolls, grass withers and flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. But how? Does that word literally endure, right? With the exception of the stone tablets from Sinai, which of course were also broken, divine words are supposed to endure on parchment and papyrus, on materials that are just as perishable as grass and flowers through fallible human copying. And actually, this is kind of amazing. In this very example, the line that we just read, a scribe forgot most of it and so he had to write it in vertically kind of in the in, in at the edge of the column right so this sacred text just barely endured why should we trust that materials made from dead animals made from plants copied by tired scribes with greasy sticky hands can ensure that divine speech survives so this is really one argument against the cliche that we hear a lot about the power of writing to preserve speech right that this is a durable preservation technology that is more lasting than human memory. So uh, of course, Plato, through the words of his uh, teacher, Socrates, who uh, famously wrote nothing but talked a lot, uh, warned that writing technology 
could implant forgetfulness in people's souls. This is a Phaedrus. Uh, so people would rely on an external crutch rather on their own memory, their own, their own uh, mental capacities. But besides the Greek concern that writing atrophies the memory, there's another problem, right? If the point of writing is to reliably preserve knowledge over time, well, it doesn't really work that well, right? In many, many Jewish and Christian discourses, writing can be as precarious as memory itself, or more so. So it's contingent on fickle human stewardship, on perishable material. We have texts being constantly lost or hidden or censored, burned, drowned, right? They get lost, they disintegrate, they mingle with dirty and rotting things of the world. So I want to examine this set of ideas in uh, literary, religious, and scholarly frameworks, which really overlap, I think, along these implicit shared theories about material text, okay? So this idea of material text, scholars of religion have really started to take seriously, call to attend to material evidence, material practices, and of course, book historians, material philologists, have been reminding us all the time that texts are not just kind of inert or transparent vehicles for words, right? They're always material objects too, and that includes digital texts. But people have really been keenly aware of textual materiality long before the topic of modern scholarly historical analysis. So the, the uh, pre-modern people were aware of materiality, not just as a practical matter of craftsmanship and of practical care for texts, but I want to say as part of their own religious creativity, right? This was part of the discourse. Our texts are material. They're always material. And this is something people think about religiously in ways that I don't think has really been kind of identified uh, all that much. So one example that I really like is we have an ancient tradition known as the two tablets tradition. And this goes back to at least Josephus in the first century. And he relates that the divine wisdom from Adam and Eve had to be recorded in two different ways, on clay and on stone. And that was because it, it had to survive any mode of catastrophe. If God brought down a flood, the clay would disintegrate, but the stone would remain. But if God destroyed the world by fire, the clay would harden like in a kiln, and so the ancient knowledge would survive in that medium. So uh, back up your data in two different forms. Uh, we've got just one example here uh, from early Judaism and early, early Christianity of how material texts and their chances for survival and their vulnerability have really been salient concepts in the religious imagination. It's just one example of how that works. So my talk today is part of a larger project on manuscript discovery stories old and new as a genre, right? With intersecting scholarly and religious discourses about how sacred texts are transmitted over time in the world of matter, in the world of human decisions, human history. The stories we tell about how texts survive tell us a great deal about the cultural concept of writing and the idea of revelation and the possibility of accessing the past. And it's about how both scholars and religious writers have thought of the Torah and of other sacred texts as historical and contingent, surviving, if barely, in material form in human history. So today specifically, I'll focus on one aspect of this contingency of textual survival, contamination and decay. So I'm gonna organize things around three accounts of access to ancient texts, each with a different degree of fictionality, each shedding light on a continuum between scholarship and religious myth. Now, the first is a 16th century narrative from Moshe Cordovero about the origins of the Zohar, the uh, uh, Kabbalistic uh, text. It's reconstitution in fragments from a garbage heap. The second part takes its inspiration from a work of modern Hebrew fiction, uh, Nobel Prize winner uh, Shai Agnon's Forevermore, Adolam, a short story about a scholar who finds a lost ancient chronicle in a leper hospital, a book that itself has become like seeping leprous flesh that cannot be directly touched. Agnon's story is embedded in mid-century Israeli culture and scholarship, including the revolutionary manuscript finds of the 40s and 50s that we started with. And finally, third, we'll return to those manuscript discoveries themselves 
the Bar Kokhba documents digested by rodents, and the decomposing Dead Sea Scrolls. So in these tales of filth and decay, texts need rescuing from the ravages of material form, which is both their only mode of survival and the greatest threat to their survival. Often the threat of decay is also connected not just to the materiality of the text, but to the mediating human other, a person who finds or holds but is thought to have no rightful claim to the text. So thank Bedouin discoverer. That's not the only example. The scholar is a hero of the hazmat zone, enduring discomfort and disgust to repair the transmission of the sacred past. And without him, what is supposed to be sacred and eloquent risks succumbing to biology, soiled and mute. Okay, so from the heady days of uh, the Judean desert in 1951, we travel back in time to the Kabbalistic Renaissance in uh, 16th century Tzfat. Before Isaac Luria was Moshe Cordovero, a systematizer of Kabbalah who produced an encyclopedic, encyclopedic commentary on the entire Zohar uh, called Oryakar, uh, Precious Light. So he relates a version of the Zohar's origin story. He says, there are those who say the Zohar was found in a cave in Maron by an Ishmaelite farmer and was sold to merchants of spices and perfumes who used it to wrap the spices. And a scholar who was in Israel found it in Sfat, scattered, disordered, and torn. And he gathered it and made great efforts and even went to the garbage to gather up the small pieces that were sold to the merchants of spices. So in this legend here, uh, the precious purportedly ancient manuscript is torn up. It's used to wrap food or spices and tossed in the trash. The recovery and collation of the text is dirty work. You gotta root through the trash. A scholar picks through the dump to recover whatever can be salvaged from the refuse. Now the Zohar is uh, traditionally attributed to the second century sage, Shimon Bar Yochai, but uh, originates according to historical critical scholars in 13th century Spain for, with the Kabbalist Moshe de Leon, uh, its primary composer and redactor. And like many pseudepigraphic texts, it's got a fabricated story of provenance, which of course explains how a text that claims to be from the second century has just recently happened to turn up in our time, right? And uh, as always, caves are a very convenient explanation for how texts appear. And in this case, it's very apt because especially since the uh, Talmud tells us about Shimon Bar Yochai's miraculous 12-year dwelling in a cave near Maron. So makes perfect sense. Origin stories are authorizing strategies, of course, for these new texts. They construct an ancient pedigree for something that's newly composed. Everyone knows the story of Josiah and the scroll found in the temple, etc. But they're also their own genre with conventions and a history. So some elements of Cordovero's story participate in a larger constellation of traditions about textual discovery in general, and others might shed light on the history of the Zohar most, more specifically. So the character of the original discoverer, an ethnic other here, an Ishmaelite farmer, really follows a paradoxical pattern in many of these stories that I've found. He's both the one who knows the way to the text and an obstacle to its transmission and its survival. He finds, but he severely mishandles the texts because he misunderstands what they are, right? This is a category error. He lets them become just physical objects, not carriers of meaning, not carriers of revelation, of secrets, of verbal wisdom. So later historical real accounts of manuscript discovery kind of inflect this, inflect their descriptions of Arab discoverers through colonial and orientalist lenses. But it's a much, much older trope than colonialism. Uh, I've got a persistent rumor about the Bedouin, for example, who discovered the first Dead Sea Scrolls and one that was included in the original discoverer's own testimony 10 years later was that they wanted to use the parchment as replacement sandal straps. And here I, I'm going to suggest the work of Ian Waret on kind of on the, the very Orientalist way that we frame this idea as something just like hilarious in the scholarship. Um, 19th century English colonial accounts about the discovery of Christian manuscripts in Syrian and Egyptian monasteries 
accuse local monks of using leaves of ancient gospels as butter wrappers or covers for their jars of jam. Right? And one of these discoverers say, well, we, we got we got this, this ancient page of the gospel because they ran out of jam and they didn't need the cover anymore. I mean, it's yeah, that kind of thing. Or even as mats for monks' feet on cold stone floors. In the 1940s in Egypt, the Nag Hammadi manuscripts are no sooner discovered by locals than their mother reportedly throws them into the fire as kindling. So the original discoverers or the longtime stewards of the text have made this error of understanding what they have. The texts are just parchment sheets. They're just wrappers, sandal straps, jar covers, fuel, floor mats. They're no longer vehicles for words. So if you think about textual materiality, this is just the materiality part. The material and mundane misappropriation of textual material threatens the survival of the sacred past. And of course, what happens next is, th is that they must be rescued by those who claim them as their own heritage. The story about the Zohar's discovery from the trash also reveals a specific motif related to its textual history, its original fragmentation. Um, I'm going to point to the work of Daniel Abrams, who connects Cordovero's passage to the actual literary history, the critical history of the Zohar, which he claims was not a unified book, but a collection of kind of related fragments that circulated separately and were later kind of redacted and collected into the thing that we call the Zohar. He writes that the book of the Zohar is a late invention that should not be attributed to the process or intention of its composition in the 13th century. It wasn't written, it wasn't edited, and it wasn't distributed as a book by the various figures who produced the literary units that were later known by the name Zohar. So for Abrams, Cordovero's passage demonstrates a critical appreciation of the literary form of the Zohar in the face of traditions that simplistically attribute, it, uh, attribute the book to Shimon Bar Yochai, right? So instead of a unified book, the collection was initially in fragments, just as the legend relates. And this passage mediates, he says, between the desire to posit a lost original, right? There is a lost and recovered original, and yet be faithful to the acknowledged disorder of the documentary evidence in their possession. So if Abrams is correct about this, the legend is aware of and narratively captures the actual historical state of Kabbalistic manuscripts, which can only be kind of retroactively called a book. And so the religious legend here narrates a partly critical version of textual origins. So more generally, the legend speaks to the broader fear about fragmentation and loss of religious knowledge. <laughs> this awareness that our understanding of the past is only piecemeal, that we only possess a partial record of the vast repertoire of writing that existed in ancient times. This awareness is very old and is pre-critical. It is found in many traditions, both Jewish and Christian, about sacred texts that aren't available in any library. And ancient writers really didn't need modern scholars to tell them about the loss and fragmentation of ancient knowledge. They were no less sure than we are that their written heritage had a deep history that was only partially available to them. And they expressed it through their own religious discourses, through their own scriptural interpretation. Those texts we have have barely survived against the odds through human censorship and human error, material degeneration, natural disasters, political repression. The Zohar is the book that almost wasn't, just like the Torah itself, as I've written in, in, in other contexts. The Zohar legend also makes the scholar a rescuer of revelation from the past, right? A past that requires salvage. In a discovery narrative nested within a discovery narrative, the scholar sorts through garbage heaps to gather and restore a damaged record. This image is, of course, very rhetorically effective uh, because uh, the written material, ancient and divine, is exactly the opposite of trash, right? This is, this is the juxtaposition of, of opposites. And uh, this has been really irresistible. Uh, take, for example, the choice of title, Sacred Trash, for the most popular book on the Cairo Geniza, which sets up the contrast between the importance of the discovery 
of these uh, of these uh, Jewish texts uh, in Egypt, and the fact that it's not only literally a collection of texts that have been discarded, but also that its physical condition is more reminiscent of a disordered pile of trash than a precious library, right? There's lots of fragmentation and damage here. Uh, of course, a Geniza is not the same as a trash heap at all. And in fact, a Geniza exists precisely because texts with the name of God are not to be thrown in the trash, right? So the association with contamination also runs through descriptions of some specific manuscripts from this Geniza. Before Solomon Schechter went to the Geniza himself, Scottish scholars, sisters Agnes Lewis and Margaret Gibson, these are the ones uh, who accused uh, Egyptian monks of using their manuscripts to cover their butter, brought back some material they'd purchased from, for, uh, from the Geniza for Schechter to identify. And one of the most important fragments was the Hebrew text of the book of Ben Sira, Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, and it was then only known in Greek translation. In Lewis's account, the dirty scrap looked like a grocer had used it for something greasy. I imagine kind of the way that you get fish and chips wrapped in a newspaper in Britain. Uh, Solomon Schechter, deciphering the greasy scrap, becomes Cordovero's mythic scholar reconstructing ancient scriptures from used food wrappers. The idea of sacred trash finds expression in other contexts beyond the Jewish tradition. And of course, I, I uh, cannot help but talk about the horde of Christian manuscripts from Oxyrhynchus, which was literally an Egyptian garbage dump that yielded the earliest textual witnesses to the New Testament, along with many, many other religious and literary materials. Scholars have long told the story of Oxyrhynchus as a tale of sacred trash as well. And some of the most important papyri, once professionally inscribed, met an unsavory fate. One striking example is what uh, papyrologist Anne-Marie Leundyke has called the toilet papyrus, a fragment of a quality copy of Scolia to the Iliad, which based on a lab analysis of the debris that was stuck to it, which you can see here in this image, uh, it ended its life as a piece of toilet paper. Lewandyke describes what restoring such a fragment may have been like. When dug up from trash heaps, papyri are crumpled up dry lumps, and they have to be straightened out first. And you have to apply some moisture to make the papyrus soft again. And you pull and rub it into shape. And Hunt, one of the main uh, scholars associated with the discovery, advised that this was best done with one's fingers. Whether it was the vapors let loose when this Homer piece was dampened or more substantial organic remains stuck to it, the conservation of that papyrus must have been a surprisingly unpleasant task. Okay, so Lynn Dyke's Dyke study does more than discuss and amuse not just a gimmick, she really has a serious point. Uh, she analyzes the Oxyrhynchus remains from the perspective of garbology, which is a real field of study that can de generate data about cultural practices based on what people throw away. Lewandyke comes to the surprising conclusion that people in antiquity really did sometimes throw they, their sacred scriptures in the trash. Before they were discarded, she says, uh, it seems that Christians would purposely shred sacred scriptures when they threw them away to break the link between sacred text and sacred manuscript. So I'm not going to assess this theory in the context of ancient Christianity, but uh, we do see here these twin themes of trash and fragmentation in these discourses about textual survival and recovery. Now, uh, this conceptual pair, sorry, this conceptual pair of, uh, of uh, trash and fragments resonates in literary accounts about the discovery too like Tony Harrison's 1990 play, The Trackers of Oxyrhynchus, which is based partly on a play of Sophocles that was extant only in a few quotations until a more substantial remains uh, were found in our, uh, at Oxyrhynchus. And uh, Grenfell and Hunt are the main characters. They're the main scholars associated with the discovery. And Apollo calls on them from his existence in the trash heap to find the scraps and tatters of the lost play and prevent it and him from becoming mere manure. I'm a god, Apollo, but I was tipped on a rubbish tip inside this manuscript, covered in rubbish, but what's much worse is being resurrected with scarcely half my verses, converted into dust and bookworm excreta, riddled lines with just the ghost of their meter. So the focus here is on the classical Greek world, 
in its fuller emergence from the dump of Oxyrhynchus. But this evocation of the themes of trash and fragmentation of gods in the garbage, right, found already in our Zohar legend, really kind of shows the staying power um, and uh, the, the broadly shared cultural resonance of this connection. So my next vignette here from within Jewish literature comes from a work of fiction, Shai Agnon's short story Forevermore, Ad Olam. I'm drawing here a lot on the work of uh, Ilana Pardes, uh, who stressed Agnon's intimacy with biblical texts, which is evident all over his work. And Forevermore appeared at the height of a new movement in biblical criticism in the newly established state of Israel, uh, with political and military leaders like Ben-Gurion and Yigal Yadin really deeply invested in the whole enterprise. Um, so Israeli biblicism focused on recovering the Bible, the Tanakh, as a historical document of identity, of connection and belonging to the land. And it was deliberately unmoored, right? Deliberately disconnecting it from the rabbinic traditions, from, from Midrash, that they associated with a kind of diasporic past that was best left behind, best, best left behind according to this model. So Agnon also wrote in the midst of media attention to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, including controversies about who should have access to them, where they should be kept and what they mean, and the earliest scholarly attempts to decipher and reconstruct the fragments. So the recovery of ancient scriptures, both through new modes of interpretation and through newly discovered manuscripts, this was in the air, right? This was the, the cultural world he lived, lived and wrote in. And Agnon was deeply interested in the textual heritage of ancient Israel, but he was also critical, right? So his short story that we're gonna talk about forevermore, it reads to me in part like a parody of biblical scholarship, of biblical philology, and you'll see how that works. So in this story, uh, the protagonist named Adiel Amze is a scholar occupied for many years with something called the Book of Gumli Data. It is a chronicle of a destroyed city. Now the kicker here is that this book doesn't exist, it's lost. But Amze is still obsessed with small details of its theoretically reconstructed text, right? such as exactly how the city's walls were breached and little tiny details and points of linguistic form. Right? Again, he doesn't have the actual book. He's devoted his solitary career to these technical details of a book that nobody has. Now, as the story opens... Amza is about to meet a publisher who's finally willing to publish his life's work, but he receives a surprising visit, an old nurse looking for reading material for patients in a leper hospital. And as they talk, Amza finds out that the lost book of Gumli Data has been in that very leper hospital all along. So everything changes with this revelation, right? That the lost book is recoverable. Amza skips the meeting with the publisher, to discover this long lost text among the lepers. And it is tattered, decayed, contaminated, barely legible. The book had been touched by the hands of many untouchables and it seemed almost as if it were not written on parchment but on the skin of a leper and not ink but pus had been used to inscribe the words. So the book itself has become untouchable. And we have a scene of a caretaker outfitting Amza with an antiseptic apron from his neck to his feet and a pair of white gloves that they tied to his hands so they wouldn't fall off. And Adiel Amza sat there and painstakingly read every letter, every word, column and page, the caretaker standing by his side and turning the pages. He sat there joining letter to letter and word to word until he could read whole passages without trouble. Now, his reconstruction would never be permitted to leave the leper hospital to be presented to the larger world. The lepers were the only audience for his discoveries about the ancient city. And yet, some echoes of his findings mysteriously made it out into the world, finding their way without footnotes into the work of his colleagues. And Anza commits to staying with the lepers, studying the diseased book forevermore, Ad Olam. So I've shared the story with colleagues, and we all felt very attacked, uh, very called out. Um, but if it's a commentary on biblical philology, I think it's both a parody, but also a celebration, right? There's some ambivalence here. Amza is totally ridiculous. He's obsessed with the piddly details of a missing text. But Agnon still recognizes the, the intoxication, right, of the new discovery of new reading, 
this discovery story really plays into a lot of the recurring tropes that we've already noted, right? The book is decaying into something off-putting and illegible, the skin of a leper inscribed with pus, and the scholar enters the realm of contamination and rescues its words, connects the fragments. But the leper hospital and the lepers themselves are also relevant to the structure of the story as a participant in a broader genre, right? The precious text is in the hands of people who are both its sole guardians and the main obstacles to its transmission, to its kind of broader survival, right? They hold the text, but they don't really know what to do with it. They don't know how to read it. And they prevent scholars from accessing it, in this case, because it's infected with their disease and it must stay in quarantine. Um, I, I just I, I just love the set of themes that he brings together. So let's uh, dwell a little bit longer on this most striking image, this infected book written on a leper's skin and the scholar working in PPE, right, in the protective equipment to decode it. Now, Ilana Pardes highlights the resonances of this passage with something that might have entered your mind rabbinic discussions about scriptural books that defile the hands, right? The idea that touching a biblical scroll imparts impurity to the hands that must be ritually removed. This is first articulated in Mishnah Yadayim. Now, the discussion in Mishnah Yadayim do not really explain why a holy scriptural text would impart impurity, right? Instead, they discuss exactly which texts possess this feature. So we've interpreted them as rabbinic musings or debates about the canonical status or liturgical use of texts like Esther, Kohelet, Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. So we're not going to really enter that debate here. This is a separate issue. But what I wish to point out is one partial explanation in Bavli Shabbat in the Babylonian Talmud. Why did the rabbis impose uncleanness upon scriptural books? Because originally, terumah foods, the pure, pure offerings, pure foods offered, were stored near Torah scrolls, for they argued, this is holy and that is holy. And when they saw that the books came to harm, the rabbis imposed uncleanness on them, right? So there's nothing inherently impure about holy books themselves. It's actually the opposite. The halachic definition here keeps the texts from harm. Now, why? Uh, the idea here is, is that Torah scrolls were kept together with pure food, with terma, since both were holy. But since storing them this way destroyed the scrolls, they were deemed impure, so they could no longer be kept in the same place as pure terma. So the precise kind of harm that comes to the text isn't specified here in the Talmud, but Rashi tells us, Rashi explains that uh, mice, rodents would come in to eat the food, and while there, they would take a nibble or two out of the Torah scrolls, right? So a scroll that rendered the hands impure would require special handling that protected it from damage, right? Um, such as not touching a Torah scroll directly with your hands. And calling scriptural texts impure was a functional kind of pragmatic way of ensuring that they were protected from harm, right? To place buffers in their storage and handling, keeping that text from physical contamination. Now, there are other explanations for uh, uh, for for why uh, sacred books defile the hands, but this is the one that uh, that we find uh, that we find here that might shed some light on on Amza's uh, creation. Now, it's uh, speaking of rat chewed scriptures. Let's go back to where we started. The 1960s account of the discovery of the documents at Wadi Murabat, which included scripture and documents of Bar Kokhba, that second century Jewish revolutionary. To say that the text suffered the depredations of visiting animals, human and otherwise, particularly rodents, with an, a lack of appreciation for true values, we see that this account anthropomorphizes rodents, but it also dehumanizes people. Um, another part of the narrative uh, describes a Bedouin discoverer discover being kidnapped, like literally kidnapped off the street by British soldiers, kind of tossed into a van, into a jeep, and marched at gunpoint for hours through the desert to show them to the cave. And the entire account is told like it's, like it's a hilarious joke, right, in a couple of different sources. Now, what else does this narrative about the misuse of manuscripts for rats' nests and their processing into fertilizer tell us? Here again, the scholar gets his hands dirty. Each rat's nest is almost sure to produce remnants of a written document or two. 
like the scholar searching through the garbage heap to piece together fragments of Kabbalistic secrets. And like Agnon's absurd protagonist in his hazmat suit, joining letter to letter and word to word, those who study the texts of, uh, of this cave hope to rescue and read scraps of parchment repurposed by rodents. Other scraps are processed even more, digested and excreted and turned into fertilizer, decaying into the landscape. So there's no question that the idea of Jewish orange groves near Bethlehem, nurtured by the priceless ancient manuscripts written by their forefathers, is an extremely corny piece of storytelling, but it participates in a broader cultural concern with the decay of verbal knowledge into matter. And here's my Canadian content. Canadian artist uh, Guy Lame has expressed this concept through a series of sculptures. He carves landscapes out of discarded books. In these evocative pieces, the verbal function of the books is literally destroyed and reshaped into hills and rock faces and mountain ranges. In his artist statement, Laramé writes explicitly about the kind of life cycle of verbal communication as the ancient manuscripts that become orange groves. Mountains of disused knowledge return to what they are, mountains. They erode a bit more and they become hills. Then they flatten and become fields where apparently nothing is happening. Piles of obsolete encyclopedias return to that which does not need to say anything, which simply is. So written knowledge, explicitly sacred or not, is at the mercy of its material forms, always at risk of going the way of all flesh. Now, already the first generation of Dead Sea Scrolls scholars feared that the scrolls, frozen in time in dry caves for 2,000 years, to an extent, would literally disappear and decompose much faster after they came out. As leather deteriorates, apparently, it darkens until it is reduced to a deep amber-colored gelatinous mass, not unlike hardened glue. And then when subjected to moisture, it gradually evaporates. And this advanced state of uh, disintegration of some of the le leather fragments was mistakenly called pitch in the early days of the scroll discovery. Uh, so lots of discourse about uh, the danger of decomposition or destruction of the scrolls that, uh, that were discovered after 2000 years, um, written by some of the same people who would, for instance, smoke a cigarette while um, <laughs> leaning over fragments. This is Gerald Lancaster Harding, a very kind of famous, uh, famous photo that's become part of kind of Dead Sea Scrolls pop culture. Will all the scrolls in time be reduced to a blackened gelatinous mass that will gradually evaporate into thin air? It's almost a haiku. All right. Now, recent practices in the preservation of manuscripts have featured no cigarettes, but latex gloves, white coats, microscopes and climate controlled environments like the Dead Sea Scrolls Conservation Lab at the Israel Museum. The technicians spend much of their time cleaning the fragments, not from garbage or rat droppings, but from the residue of scotch tape used by the first generation of Qumran scholars to connect letter to letter and word to word. Now nothing is permitted to touch the fragments like Amza in Forevermore, the specialists who handle them wear gloves and coats, although it's to protect the fragments and not the reader. Even the minuscule scraps that carry no words and no marks at all are suspended in time. For display, one practice is to sew fragments uh, between barely their netting, so they appear suspended in space as well. The scientific process of conservation in the sterile lab, where nothing touches the fragments except the gloved hand of a specialist, it really makes us feel better, right? It, it allays fears about the soiled and stained decaying manuscript that is about to revert into a pile of gross matter and then disappear. After not just the orientalized descriptions of ignorant, reckless discoverers and photos of scotch tape using smoking scholars, we are relieved to see gloved hands, white coats, and precision instruments. And I've kind of heard like gasps of, of relief from students 
none of whom can read Hebrew, none of whom have anything to do with the Valley of the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they see that this is how they're treated. The image of the text in the library wouldn't produce the same effect, right? Because these are the trappings of a science lab, which is culturally coded as the most comforting vision of competence and sterility and rigor. And this is where the past is reconstituted and purified and preserved, and the decay of organic matter can at least be slowed down. So what do our stories about the filth that threatens our ancient books tell us about ourselves? Right, the discovery of sources, especially the most privileged artifacts, ancient texts, is a condition for doing history and philology. It's evidence. But the motif of these soiled books specifically and, and the other ways we talk about textual discovery and survival really challenge the boundaries between literary and religious and scholarly knowledge. Our evidence comes to us already wrapped in myth. Stories of filth and decay play into our fears of a metaphorical contamination and erosion of our archives and religious anxieties too about eroding tra traditions. And our narratives reveal a desire to recover the past, but also a deep mistrust of that possibility because our texts, which we value as eloquent or even sacred linguistic messengers, barely escape becoming worthless trash and mute matter. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so before we move to the Q&A period, I really should have started with this. First of all, by acknowledging um, Anna Stern, she's the director for the, of the Center for Jewish Studies, but also that this is the Joseph and Gertie Schwartz Memorial Lecture um, and supported by them. I don't know if the Schwartz family is here, but um, thank you to them 